So the only place I'm amicable anymore, I think, is like the Netherlands. You know, <laughs> I think it's still like you know, there's, there's still like an amicable, you know, but it's it's out of print most places. It's, it, and it, so I'm it, so every secret thing is a Susanna Cares book again. Yeah. Thank you. So we were curious about the different locations that you select mm -hmm. um, for your books, and we were wondering if there was a connection um you know to you personally for example you know cornwall or scotland now you did share that you lived in wales for a while mm -hmm. so that you know certainly is a connection any other connections I, I lived in wales to research the book actually i lived in i lived in the house where i set the book um because that oh, i always wanted to do that james mitchner used to do that and i always thought that sounded like a really fun thing to do to live in the place where you were writing the book and it turned out that was actually that was my book named the dragon that I lived in the house where I set the book and it turned out that that was the one book that I took it to my editor at the time Humphrey and Humphrey handed it back to me said I can't see the setting um and I realized that it was because it was so familiar to me that I saw it every day and I had to actually pay attention because I had taken the book up to London to you know to hand to him he was so fun he was so fun I miss Humphrey he his way of editing was you would go into his office very old style he was very young but his very old style editor you'd take the manuscript up to him and he'd have a bottle of scotch and two glasses and a bunch of pencils and that, that was your editing session it's like heaven and um the um and I took the train back down to Wales I remember and I had to pay attention what is it that makes this area different you know what what am i going back into because normally you you have the outsider's eye going into an area you and the, and i have lost that because i live there every day and you know so it's it's having that outsider's eye that gives you the the ability to then paint that for the reader right what is it about you know and, and you think about the place that you live yourself what is it that makes the um you know it, it when I go when I go back to you know Aiken for example and I'm um, you know going to my my sister's old house and and um, you know it's the way the light falls through the pines right you know a, a South Carolina has, has a look right you know it's uh, that that lets you know you're in that part of the world and um, it's it's a softness and and so you you see things a certain way that that lets you know you're there. Um, the place where I grew up is on one of the Great Lakes and, and it has pines too, but it's a different, it's a different look. And the pines make a sound and it only makes that sound there. So you paint that for people, right? And it's it's getting that type of thing. So it's sometimes sometimes kind of fun to just go stand where you live and say, what is it that makes me know that I'm home? When you've been away, what what says home to you? Um, but so that was that was Wales. Um, Cornwall was a was a special book, um, and I think we'll you know we'll probably get to that one a little bit later. But the um, the uh, everywhere else, it's it's a lot of the time the setting for the book is dictated by the story itself. I, I find a bit of history um, that I didn't know about, something I didn't know. And I call it my, I usually call it my huh moment, my, my, where I'm reading something or I'm watching something on television or I come across a, a, a person in my, my research and I didn't know about it. And I, I kind of go, huh, you know, and, and, and it sticks with me and it, it won't go away. And it starts building like a snowball, like a, just like a little snowball. And it just, um, usually over years more and more sticks to it and and before I know it I've got I've got a story building I've got something that just is walking up my shoulder and, and you know it, it becomes a story um but it can only happen in that one spot and um it's dictated by what is actually happening so for example the winter sea happens at Slains, that's where it's going to happen. It's going to happen at Gruden Bay and Slains because that's where the history happens. So I had written probably about two thirds of that story before I ever went to Slains because of the way they, it wrote so fast. 
that story. It wrote so quickly. My sister had been diagnosed with, with the cancer um, in the summertime. And I had started writing the story just about the same time. It was within weeks that I had started writing that story. Um, and uh, I, that book was my safe place. So I was just going into that book all the time, the whole time she was dying. Um, I did not get to Slane's until after she had passed. Um, and uh, I was, to be honest, I was trying to finish the book for her. I was trying to finish the book so she could read it. Mariana is her favorite story. And I always thought she would, I always thought she would like this one better, um, but she didn't really get a chance to read it. So the, um, but I was trying to write her another, her and my dad, another story kind of like Mariana. Um, and, uh, but it just wrote itself. It was, it was literally like channeling. It was like having this, all these people. It was very much like what was happening to Carrie. Everybody was just coming. And, and when I finally got a chance to go to Scotland to get the settings down and get the details that I needed, um, you know, I already had two thirds of the book already written. And I had set Carrie's Cottage at that point, anybody that knows the book, I had set Carrie's Cottage originally on the beach, like I, I over, overlooking the beach. Mm -hmm. And then I got there and realized it was all dunes and that wasn't gonna work at all because, you know, we just sort of, her cottage would just gently slide into the water every year and it, right. just, it wouldn't work at all. So the people in the men in, in the St. Olaf in the pub were, were fun because the, um, the, well, the landlord initially wouldn't let me in the, the one half of the, the pub because it wasn't ladylike to go in the one half of the pub. But I had to stay in the, the, the proper side, not go in the other side. And eventually he, he let me in the one side and everybody decided that the, the, play, the best place for Carrie's cottage would be up on Ward Hill because there were actually the, um, the foundations of a ruined cottage up there. And once I got up and stood on Ward Hill, then everything came to life. Then you can see the castle on the one side and the beach on the other. And then I'm in Carrie, you know, and, and not really in her. It's more like the character is standing on my, right behind me. Like a, they're, they're kind of sitting at your shoulder and you're seeing what they're seeing, but you're not really them. You're just kind of, you're, you're walking with them. It's more like if, if anybody's read Firebird, I'm more like Robbie. I'm just more like walking around, seeing what they're seeing, but I'm not them. And uh, it's, uh, it was just quite a, quite a fun thing. So, but the, the setting is always dictated by the story, but I have to go to the setting. And it was my mother who pointed out that it wasn't, I used to joke that, you know, it was just a really good way to get a vacation, but you know, oh yeah, I have to go to the setting. Um, and she said, no, you actually yeah, absolutely. do. Yeah, you do. She said, she said, you actually do because a lot of the time you don't, the characters don't start moving for you until you're there. And she, she's a wonderful person to travel with my mom because she knows she's been to a lot of the settings with me. She's been to Portugal. She's been to Russia. She's been to all these places with me, uh, Italy for a desperate fortune, um, and she knows enough that like when we were in St. Petersburg and we're on the Strelka in St. Petersburg and I'm sitting on the bench and, and Robbie and Nicholas start talking or, you know, um, Edmund and Anna start talking. I can just see my mother get a look on her face and she just goes off and gets herself an ice cream cone because she knows I'm going to be another hour like with these characters. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, a, it's a process. I have to be on the spot and then the characters start moving. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit about the Rose Garden. Uh, mm -hmm. Your characters, Ava Ward, Daniel Butler, we're all in love with Daniel Butler. Uh, and praise to you for the surprise at the end. And I'm, people have to read the book. I'm not going to say anything more, but I thought that was very clever. Oh, thank you. Um, and silly me, even though I've been to Scotland and I did the Outlander tour, I didn't realize that the Jacobite Rebellion had support in England and in yeah. Ireland. I thought it was yeah. only Scotland. So my praise to you and, and wanna talk a little bit more about the, your ability to blend accurate historical facts, you know, your research 
with the fiction that you create is so well done. So okay. we want you, we, we'd like you to talk a little bit about your, your writing and the research process. Um, and I know the Rose Garden is um, dedicated to your sister. Yes. And I love the first line in the book. So you might want to share that with us. Uh, so I just let you talk about your research and your writing. Well, I actually, I thank you. That's very kind of you. I, I lost my only sister in the last days of September. And that came to me as a first line. A lot of my lines come to me in, in the bathtub. Um, which, which, the bathtub, in did the you say? Bathtub, yeah. In the which, bathtub. <laughs> yeah, which uh, partly it's because my characters are just so countermashes. I mean, they, they, they get me when, they used to get me when I had no paper. So now I'm onto them. I have paper all over the, I have a bathtub ledge, right? And they, they, I, I'm onto them, but the it used to be when when my kids were very very small, um, and my husband would come home from work, I would just go up and take a bath because that was my relaxed time, and I I would put on the bathroom fan and I would get, I'm very short, I'm like about five foot, and our tub is about five foot two, and I can float and. <laughs> It's, I, I can fill it up and, and it becomes like one of those sensory deprivation tanks, right? You put the fan on, the water's the right temperature and I hit theta state and I can just, it, it's like all my subconscious and everything just comes out and all the books just, all the, all the characters just start talking. And I get a lot of ideas and a lot of lines and I get a lot of scenes and I come down with, I don't think I have any around here. No, I don't. Um, but I do. I, I come down with like pieces of paper written on and scenes and everything all written. And um, and then they just a lot of time those just work themselves right into the book. Um, eventually, I don't know where they're going to happen, but they they write themselves right into the book. Um, sometimes they're just on little you know scraps of paper. But the um, so I knew that I had that that first sentence, and I also knew I was just not ready to write it um, because it happened. Uh, right after the winter scene, um, and I just thought, no, I'm not, I'm not ready to write that book yet. And um, and then I, I thought, well, what if I change it? What if I change it to I lost my only sister in the last days of November, which is the same rhythm, but it's not me. What if I make it someone else? And all of a sudden this other voice came up and it became somebody else and it was somebody else's journey and somebody else's story. And writing is nothing other than processing life. It's what we do. That's what writers are. And that's what, if anybody who's out there watching this, if you write, um, you know, first of all, if you, you know, if anybody ever calls you an aspiring writer, just knock the aspiring off. Because if, if you process life through words, you're, you're a writer. That's what you do. Whether you ever get published or not, that's what you do. You're a writer. And that's, that's what I do. That's how the, every single one of my books is a certain time and period of my life in which whether I knew it or not, recognized it or not, I was processing different things that were going on in my world at the time. And, you know, so you couldn't have written that book if you hadn't been going through whatever you were going through at the time in your life. Um, or if you had not lived certain experiences of your life. Um, if I hadn't had my children, I wouldn't have written certain scenes of my books. Um, if you know, if I hadn't had certain highs and lows, and if I didn't have the relationship with my family that I had, wouldn't have certain things happen. Um, so every book is a little piece of you in that way. And you, have, you leave behind these little bits of your story. That's why no two people will ever, ever tell a story the same way. You may have the same general idea, but you're never going to tell the same story. So you never need to worry about somebody totally stealing your idea because you're, you're going to tell it in a different way. Anyway, so I got the idea that I'm going to tell this person's story. And she, she ends up taking her sister's ashes back to a place where her sister was happy. 
I made her sister famous because my sister always wanted to be famous. Um, it's the only time that I've ever taken the first part of a book and given it to someone for approval. I gave it to my brother-in-law for approval because that first scene in the book is very similar to what actually happened. Anybody that ever, you know, I wear a lot of rings, but this ring is the ring from the Rose Garden. Um, it's the Colada ring from the Rose Garden. And that was my sister's ring. Um, and it has only left my finger once, or well, twice. It fell off once when I was coming home from um, the, the time that she passed, fell off in the airplane. And I thought I'd lost it and then found it, put it back on a minute. I lost it again just last year when I was cleaning clothes and my best friend found it and put it back on. So, you know, it's, that's not coming off that finger again. It's wedged, it's wedged on. Um, but uh, the, uh, the reason I took her to Cornwall was because it was the place that we had gone when I was a little girl. And I purposely did not go back to that particular town village in Cornwall again, um, because I wanted it to be a memory of what it had been when, when I was a kid, when we were kids. I put, put her in the same house that we'd been in when we were kids and used my memories and the photographs and stuff. I, re, um, I reconfigured the house because the actual house, Landavity Manor, you can actually, you can actually rent it. It's a, it's a guest house. It's, you can take a bunch of friends. It's a little expensive, but you can take a bunch of friends and go, go stay there. Um, but the, um, I, uh, I had to reconfigure it because it, it's from a little bit later date than what I needed. It's about a hundred years younger than what I needed. But uh, other than that, I left everything the same, including that bloody hill that you have to climb up, which is at about an angle like this, if you ever, you know. So make sure that you- Got that idea from reading that, yeah, it was pretty steep. <laughs> make sure that you don't drink too much at the pub uh, before you climb the hill. But everything else is pretty much the same. If you go to Paul Perro, you'll find everything pretty much the same. Um, so that was a very special book to write. And it, I had always said I would never, 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 never write a time travel book ever in my life. Um, partly because Diana Gabaldon has done so well. And, and partly because the rules of time travel are so tricky. So incredibly tricky. Um, and they're hard to get around, you know, like the, um, but I then thought of, I don't know if anybody's seen the more modern remake of The Time Machine with Guy Pierce. Um, that's what kind of got me thinking around it because he plays in, in, the, in the more modern film remake of it, he loses his, it's a little bit of a spoiler alert here. His fiance is killed at the beginning of the movie and he invents the time machine where he makes the time machine to go back to try to rescue her but every time he goes back to try to rescue her it doesn't work like he will rescue her from the one way she was killed but she's killed another way like he'll rescue her from the muggers but she's run over by a carriage sort of thing because it is just her moment to die and I thought that was such a unique way to approach the concept because you know I'm a I was born in 1966 I'm like a Star Trek baby right so you know like the 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 whole concept of you know the the prime directive don't go back and change anything don't change anything because you're gonna you're gonna mess everything up this turned that on its head it was like you can't mess anything up there's no way you can mess anything up because the moving finger is already there and there's nothing you can do about it and that was a really liberating concept to to kind of go into time travel with. and I thought I wonder what would happen if you wrote a time travel book yeah. with that idea and uh and it was it was kind of neat because um I I, I share your love of Daniel um the the that time period the early 1700s was a time of great reason um 
you find a lot of strong women, you find a lot of very intelligent men and women, you find a lot of people embracing science, you find um, a falling away of superstition. Um, this is, you know, sort of the end of the, the power of people pointing at witches and stuff and people are going, no, that I don't think so. You know, this is sort of, you know, um, it's the rise of reason. And um, it's, uh, it was really interesting to be able to create a character who, who was more ruled by intelligence and reason than anything else and, and see again what happened there. And, um, and then to kind of weave them into the larger fabric, because what happens with all my characters is once they're out in, you know, Susanna land, they just kind of wander around and I never know where they're going to show up again. I never know. It's, they're just out of their cage and they wander about in, um, I don't know if anybody's read the novella that I did within the, there's a book called The Deadly Hours that I did with a group of friends and Daniel and Ava make an appearance in that. Um, and it was really fun to, you know, because they just turned up. They just, I had no plans for them to turn up. They, they just did. And that happens with my characters all the time. I'll just be writing away. And then all of a sudden they're just like, morning, morning, hi. You know, it's like, what, what, you know, it, it's, it, they just turn up and it, it is just a joy as a writer to have these people come back on the page. So I, I just sort of, I have no idea when they're going to. You, you do have some favorites like Robbie who becomes Rob. Um, yeah. Rob you, was that, fun. That, that was actually, that favorites. was, that was a Florida reader, by the way, from Melbourne. I, I read uh, that. Yeah, mm -hmm. who uh, yeah, who actually <laughs> suggested, you know, she, she, well, she asked me, she said, is Robbie ever going to get his own book? And I'm like, but he's eight. How can he get his own book? And then I thought, well, he was eight and nine, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. and I, I had no idea what he was going to be like on the page. And then he turned up on the page and I was like, he's cool. That's cool. Because, you know, we, we did have a question because some writers write the end of their books and then go back. Yeah. and right toward that ending. Do you do that or is yeah. it more like a movie in your head? It's like and a movie in my head. Sometimes, sometimes I can, um, sometimes I have an idea. I get the first line first and that's when I know I have a book. When I get that first line, I know I have a book. Um, I have this nebulous sense of, um, you know, like a situation, right? Like I have the, uh, you know, for the, for the, for the vanished days, I knew it was the, the new one. I have a, I knew it was going to have to do with Edinburgh. I knew it was going to, um, part of it was going to take place at the same time as the Winter Sea and involve some of the same characters, you know, off to this, like it's going to weave in and out of the timeline of the Winter Sea, but I didn't know how. Um, I knew it was going to be dual timeline, but all in the past, and I'd never done that. Um, so I was kind of scared of attempting that. Um, I knew the main character who was narrating, it was a man. And I knew that was going to be really scary because I, it was like, I've never done a first person male character before. Um, that was kind of tricky because I just heard his voice all the time. Um, and so I, I have all these little scraps of things, but I don't know what it is I'm writing. And I knew it had to do with, um, in some way, with the Darien expedition, um, the Scottish Darien expedition to found a colony. Um, so just to be on the safe side, I took a cruise to Panama, you know, because you never know when you might, you know, so it was just kind of, you know, might need this. Um, but, uh, you know, as it turned out, I didn't need to go, but, you know, what the heck, it was worthwhile. And, um, you know, it, it uh, so I have all these little things and then you get the first line and you get the character. And I, you know, when I do my reading, I'm not gonna read the very beginning of the book because it's kind of, that would be cheating for you because you can go on my website and read the opening chapters. So that's kind of giving you something you can already get. Yes, but the, yeah. yeah, but the, um, but once I get that first, that first opening, then it just starts kind of building. And I get to know the characters the way you get to know people at a party, right? You, they come in and you, you're like, oh, 
well, they look kind of like this and they look kind of, and I think they're kind of like this. And um, one of the characters, I won't give anything away, um, but it's not giving anything away to tell you his name because his name is mentioned on the first page. His last name is Gilroy. Now, to anybody here who knows any of my books, um, you might be able to figure out how he might fit into my larger Susanna sphere um, somehow. I didn't when I first, I swear to God, <laughs> I did not know how he fit in until about, until he told me. And then I was like, oh, you schmuck, you know, and, and it, you know, I'm writing the scene going, of course you are. Of course, that's why you're here. Of course, that's who you are. And it, and it, it, it takes me a while sometimes to, because my, it's all your subconscious, right? So my subconscious is so much smarter than me. And my subconscious will put these people on the page. But a lot of the time, these people just wander on. And um, I have to just run with it and see, like it, when, in every secret thing, I needed a vicar to do a funeral. Well, in Mariana, Julia's brother's a vicar. Right. And he literally just walked onto the scene, picked up the Bible. He's like, I'll do it. I got it. You know, it's okay. Just, you know, don't worry about it. And, and, and I, I had never thought of that consciously. But of course I had a vicar. Why invent a vicar when I have a vicar, right? You know, and, and it just kind of ties it all in. You know, why go through all the trouble of inventing somebody with a new name and a new this? You already have one. And, and that's why um, your characters come so to life for us as a reader, because they are alive in your mind. They are the real. Well, they're, they're, they're like, somebody put it one way once another writer said that they have this repertory company. Of, and and it, I guess it's kind of like that, except in a repertory company, everybody plays different parts. Whereas in my, in my world, it's more like in, in um, Cornelia Funk's Inkheart. It's like once you, once you read them alive, once you read them off the page, they're, they're just out there. And you have no idea when they're going to come home, when they're going to wander. They're just out there. They're alive. They're living their lives. And when you need them, they come back. And, um, and the one in the vanished days, Gilroy in the vanished days, isn't even properly my creation. I mean, he's, he's a derivative of my creation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I created somebody and he's the result of somebody I created that, you know, came back and it's, it's it, which is even cooler in a way. Um, so it's like I created this world that is just out there propagating that I have no control over, which is, which is a lot of fun. And I just, if you hit that point, like I'm, you know, I'm only 55 and you hit that point where you're just kind of like, I wonder what's going to happen if I live to be like you know, 80 or 90, you know, how big is this world going to be and how tied up can I make it? And, and you know, I really, really want to see where it goes because, you know, it could be really cool if I, if I can do that. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in the questions um, because we're very curious about the commitment you have to G-rated love scenes. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, the easy the easy answer is to say that when I started writing, I had both grandmothers alive, you know, and then I would have had to answer, and I was unmarried, and it would have had to answer a lot of uncomfortable questions. Um, about where I got my information from. But also, I grew up reading Mary Stewart, Daphne du Maurier, um, people who wrote Close the Door scenes. And it's not to say I don't enjoy open door scenes when I'm reading, because I do. And I have a lot of friends that write them really, really well. I'm just not one of those people that writes them really, really well. Um, you either do or you don't write them well, and I don't. Um, and, and we and find I, that they're not, it's, it's not needed because the way you leave it, we can imagine what happens. We know what happens. I, I yeah. think it, I think it comes down to, um, I, again, it's, it, you have to do what you're comfortable with in, in that sense. And it's not like, you know, it, I, I always want to be careful when I talk about it because I never want to imply that there's a better way to do it. Right. I don't want to imply that people who write open door sex scenes are, are somehow 
inferior to people that write closed door sexes because there I don't think there's a there's a better or worse than I think there's a place for both um I just don't do it well I I and I also think that um I think that you you fill into the level of your own imagination I think that you know, my, my dad used to say a long time ago, he'd say, well, a pretty girl in a negligee to him was always prettier than a naked girl. And, you know, because it left something to, to be filled in. And, and I remember, um, I remember when I was little and I watched um, Gone with the Wind, you know, mm-hmm. for the first time. And, you know, Rhett carried Scarlet up the staircase and, and the next morning she's got a big smile on her face and you just think she slept really well. That's all you thought, you know, as a kid. It was, was you, 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 you had nothing to fill that time in with, right? And then you watch it again as a grown up, and you know exactly what fills in that time. But when you're younger, you don't have anything to fill it in. And it's the same with a lot of books that you read as it, like, you know, like I said, when I was younger, you could, anything I could reach, I could read. So if I'm reading Mary Stewart and I'm reading sex scenes in Mary Stewart, I'm filling them in with different stuff than my mother is filling them in with. Um, And there's a certain, I guess there's a certain um, continuity there for me that my books are books that someone can hand to their 12 year old um, or their grandmother. Um, But I didn't start out thinking that way. You know, I would have been, if I wrote a good sex scene, I would probably write a good sex scene. I just can't write. Um, I, and also, I, I, I just, it's, I, in the books that I'm writing, it's not a focus. Um, I think the, the, the romance is, you know, I definitely write, I definitely write romance and romantic books. Um, you know, I'm not, one of those people that doesn't say I write romance because I do um it's if you take the romantic thread out of the book the the whole book falls apart the the romantic relationship between the characters is definitely one of the the central threads of all my books but the um I think you can leave them at their I think you can give them their privacy 